Hey guys, this is James here from Forex Alchemist, and I am here today bringing you guys something a little bit different. We're going to do a review of the Valters faction in the most recent DLC of Endless Space 2. As many of you guys know, the Valters came out a couple of weeks ago, so I picked them up when I started playing Endless Space 2 again to, to check them out, and wanted to make a short video instead of, uh, in addition to actually, our 1 through 30 turn guide to talk a bit more about the Vaulters, um, specifically their mechanics and their strategy. So the Vaulters have a history in the lore, um, and I, I enjoy the lore of Endless Space and love the artwork. It's just not something that we talk about a lot on in this channel, and I'm going to continue that, uh, that tradition. So um, I wanted to basically take some time here to go over the different pieces of the mechanics um, that are included in the Vaulters, the Vaulters faction and how they're different mechanically from the other races and then what that allows them to do strategically. So the biggest difference is the Argosi. Um, the Argosi completely changes the way that the Vaulters handle settlement. So the Argosi is like the Vaulter's home ship, and let's talk briefly about um, turn one and then about further colonization. So in turn one, instead of starting with a set planet, instead you start around this rejuvenation field, um, asteroid field or constellation, and have a full view of the adjacent systems along different star lanes. And in every time that I've played it, there's always been at least one decent uh, planetary system connecting to uh, the rejuvenation field, and often a system with two planets. So let's just look at what we've got here. So we've got a jungle and a boreal here. So this is tier zero fertiles, although not fertile temperates. And um, let's check out down here in Hydrus, we have a Tundra. So that's not the one we're supposed to go to, obviously. So the Argosi is a super colonizer ship. Uh, it has 11 movement speed, and so you can, on your first turn, race over to your first colony and then place down a colonization. So here we have to choose whether we want the medium jungle or the boreal. So we're going to choose the jungle because it has better industry. Um, and we're going to make our home system right there. And it creates a colonization with the standard starting stuff. So three population. Two vaulters, which are you know a little bit bonus to science, and then one system of mercy, sister of mercy, which is a little bonus to um, to approval. And you can tell right away that there's an advantage to uh, to settling a an unnamed world, right, a non-special world, as opposed to settling a kind of a vanilla planet like all of the other races do, except for the Voidiani. Um, and the main reason there is that because you don't have a vanilla planet, except for the Riftborn, who have a planet that has one Titanium and one Hyperium to start, all of the other pl home planets are vanilla, no luxuries, no strategics, whereas here, you have a jungle planet that already has dis uh, dust trees, so it's giving some extra dust and approval, you're getting luxury resources, and it even has another curiosity, which I'll just grab really quick, which is, as I expected, a strategic. So you have Hyperium as well to start with. Um, and so that's what, a three Hyperium source? Yeah, a three Hyperium source to start. So that's pretty cool, um, very strong that you get this on your first turn. Now, let's talk then about how they expand. So instead of building colonizer ships like all of the other factions, which then have to go out and create outposts, which are fed by food uh, from your capital system, instead the Argosi automatically regenerates after four turns. And it will come back with a um, 
with a 10 turn cooldown that allows you to pay gold, titanium, and hyperium in order to uh, in order to activate it to be able to create another new colony. But it doesn't create outposts, it creates colonies outright with one person, uh, one population. So just as an example, here we are at turn five in this game, uh, and the Argosi is now back on its feet, uh, it has 11 move speed again, and uh, it says in 10 turns, you can do another free colonization, but in the meantime, you can accelerate that um, that colonization by paying dust, titanium, and hyperium. And this cost scales linearly downwards, 10% each turn. So after five turns, it'll be half this number, right? Like 350 dust and five titanium and hyperium. Which means, um, that you've actually you cut out with the vaulters a huge strategic decision uh, in the early game of endless space. So if you've seen a lot of our other videos, especially if you watch the Lumeris, you'll know that I talk a lot about the trade-offs between expansion and having a lot of outposts versus the benefit of having your core worlds grow. Because having an outpost for all of the other factions um, again, except the, the Voidgani and the Unfallen, um, all of the other factions have to draw resources from the home system in order to grow the outposts. And often those resources drawn don't give much of a value, but you can't turn them off. You can't choose to say, no, I don't want any ships to go to this outpost. I want it to grow on its own. And with the Vodiani, or sorry, with the Lumeris specifically, um, I talk a lot about this idea of off-piste colonization, where we discover settleable systems that are off the star lanes before we discover the uh, before we do the research of uh, allowing us to to warp, moving from from one system to another without star lanes. Um, and that allows you to settle a planet only as Lumeris to create an outpost without feeding it from your existing systems. And this is actually a huge advantage because it allows you to create other outposts without having to detract from your, your original uh, core worlds. The vaulters don't have to make that choice at all. They always want to just expand whenever possible and there's no trade-offs back to the home systems. This is similar to the Vodiani and especially the Unfallen who have those crazy food bonuses that allow them to just grow their home world so fast. Okay. So then let's get right into the next piece related to the colonization, um, which is this idea of a golden age. So. You can see here that now that the Argosi is back, um, back alive, I've got this ticker for the next Golden Age duration. So this will be the Golden Age on my next new colony that I create. And it goes up a little bit every turn. So right now it's going up two and a half turns each turn that I wait. So in five turns, it'll be uh, less than five, in like three turns, um, it'll be up at 15, which is the, the maximum number of uh, turns for a golden age. So what is a golden age? A golden age is here a set of bonuses given to you uh, and your systems during the initial turns after colonization, and they are big. You get a plus 25 bonus to manpower, all FIDs, um, approval, including 10 of, 10 of that 25 is on all of the systems in your empire, five influence, and then a bonus to the reduction in pacific conversion rate, which I don't think is important. Um, but getting plus 25 science and dust on turn one in the early game, uh, and then also bonuses on food and industry is crazy powerful, crazy powerful. 
uh, and this happens in every one of your new colonies. So we just talked about outposts. Instead of having to give up food in the early game in order to expand, the vaulters have the opposite. By expanding, they actually get bonuses to food on their empire, that they make more food when they create a new colony, and that allows them to grow and produce industry very, very fast. Specifically, one of the big benefits here is that when you have this bonus to industry, specifically, early, it allows you to create um, with a lot of speed your xeno-industrial infrastructure. And, and that means that by the time your golden age is finished, you already have your xeno-industrial infrastructure going, and you've kind of leapfrogged the longest, slowest part of any system's development until they have that industry kind of rolling. Uh, and this allows them to save, you know, a, a substantial margin. Each system moves five to ten turns, uh, let's say five turns, faster than, um, than a system of almost any other faction. So then let's talk briefly about system improvements. So system improvements here, um, the vaulters have a special uh, special trait called material expertise that allows um, resources, strategic resources that you discover to do system development upgrades. And so all of the other factions can only use the luxury resources. Here we can only see the, uh, the tier one resources, but each of them gives a flat 60 of the relevant resource to your systems. We're not going to talk about these guys because I don't like them. So let's talk about these four, the ones that I think matter, uh, the food industry, dust, and science. Um, so they give you a flat 60. With the vaulters, <clears throat> you can use the various strategic resources to get bonuses to two different, or let's say just multiple different um, different uh, FIDS bonuses. So Titanium, for example, gives 40 industry and 40 food. Hyperium gives 40 science, 40 dust, and then the more advanced ones are like three per population of those two, 5% um, per level of all four, and uh, a multiplication on all system development upgrades on the whole system. These are incredibly strong and only available to the vaulters. I'm going to specifically focus on the idea that titanium is your new god. Uh, if you've watched some of our other videos, and you know how much we value industry production in the early game as a driver of everything else in endless space, you'll know that some games are decided based on whether or not you start near the jade onyx, which is the industry-specific luxury resource that gives you a big industry boost in the early game. Here, the fact that the vaulters have a great ability to produce titanium, they're like expert resource miners, um, and can use that titanium to have a guaranteed source of bonus industry, and also the food is nice, but, but particularly bonus industry in every one of their games removes a huge amount of variability and gives them an enormous, an enormous amount of power in their early game. Um, I mean, this, and it's not even early game, it's early, mid, late. The fact that you can keep using th this titanium to drive your systems forward is an incredibly powerful ability. So for the vaulters, titanium is your new god. Next, let's talk about politics. So, if you watched the What's New in 2018 video uh, that we did catching up on patch notes, you'll know that, um, in my view, the strongest faction has shifted. It used to be pacifists, but after the political reorganization, it is now scientists. So, the... Um, the Vaulters start with a federation, which is okay, not great. I think it's the most vanilla government. But importantly, they start as scientists. And Oracle of Science isn't that important. Being able to research text in the next stage is 
so-so. The biggest reason that scientists are incredibly good is the Dirty Hands Act. The fact that this is now their level one act, uh, level one law, that for one influence per population, you can get a 20% reduction in system industry costs, system improvement industry costs, is insanely good. Um, yeah, this just reduces the, the cost of almost all of your buildings that are important in the early game by one fifth. It includes trade, trade centers, and I have been so blown away that this is a level one law because you compare this to like, you know, the pacifist law now that gives a reduction in um, a reduction in diplomatic influence costs, like. It, it's nowhere close. Even comparing it to the militarist co the, co uh, law, the minus 15% reduction to industry on ships, you spend a lot more time building system improvements than you do building ships, especially in the early game where that uh, those extra turns make more of a difference. So Dirty Hands Act is just so much stronger than lower fleet costs. So that's the politics. Um, let, next, let's talk briefly about their ships. So apart from the Argosi, which we already talked about as this cool looking fast super colony ship, the, uh, the other ship that I want to focus on for the Vultures is their scout ship. Um, and so you'll know that David and I both place a huge value in what your scout ships look like because it really kind of determines what you can do in the early game. If you have a strong scout ship, like the Empire, for example, um, then you can be very aggressive early game. If you have a weak scout ship, like the Sophons, then you really have to wait until you have the research to upgrade your ships and then build a new fleet of those ships specifically to do attack work. Um, before you can really get aggressive. And so it is not an exaggeration to say that the vaulters have the strongest scout ships in the game um, and the most flexible. So you can see here that they have two attacking, uh, attacking module options and one defensive module option with the availability of two um, support modules. That means you can build a very nice attack ship with two offense, one defense, an engine, and a manpower module, or even a uh, projectile or Hyperion booster to, to boost up your damage. And this ship will be stronger than most unupgraded um, attack and defense ships from from your first class of, uh, of military ships for, for most of the other races. But because it has the option for four support slots, you can also create an amazing explorer where you have three probes, so three probe modules, so six probes and seven base movement speed. This is an amazing early explorer ship. And because it's the same hull, you can create these excellent explorer ships early game and fan out across the, the universe exploring enormously with these six probe ships or even sometimes we can use 10 movement four probe ships um, to just race around the galaxy and then when you're when you've done some exploring and you have your targets picked out you can then take these ships and refit them as battleships um, before turn you know 40 or so in the, the earlier part of the game let's call it the mid-game, um, and go on the aggressive. Super, super strong here. All right, next up, we want to talk about the heroes. So the vaulters start with Petrov Dutka. And she's uh, an overseer class um, that starts with two abilities, as all of the heroes do, uh, plus five percent shield capacity, ho hum, and plus ten percent or plus ten industry per anomaly on colonized planets. Sometimes relevant, but not usually. I play um, 
Petrov as a governor almost exclusively. I think that's where she really shines. The, um, the big abilities that I want to highlight here are as an overseer, she has farming logistics, which give, uh, on level one, 10 food per fertile and 10 on the system. And at level two, it doubles to 20. So if you have a system with one or two fertiles, which I have found very, very common for the vaulters, uh, starting location, that's plus 60 food, and you can max out population very, very quickly. And then in the second tier of the Vaulter's ability, there's this guy over here, um, Geniocrat, which gives a plus 20% bonus to science on the system, and has two levels as well. I think it goes 20% then 30%. Um, and again, this cannot be understated in its power, especially because you've got all of this food that you're pouring into your systems. So you have really big systems. You're able to do uh, to build a lot of improvements. So these percentage bonuses coming early are fantastic. Your heroes also level up pretty quickly um, because you have uh, you're producing so much industry and you have so many so much population that yeah, I would say you level up on a system quicker than most other uh, most other factions. All right. And then, so the last thing on the mechanics that I want to touch on are these special buildings that the vaulters have called portals, which is a system improvement that, that gives 10 science and importantly allows teleportation of fleets between two systems containing the improvement. Um, I don't use these a lot early game because I use my science and Hyperium for other stuff uh, almost exclusively, but they don't cost very much. They give a little bit of science and they can save a lot of turns as you um, as you go take ships from one place to another. So in the game that um, that I did for the expert guide, we, I was just about to build portals, but I don't unfortunately go into a demonstration of these things. Um, I think that especially in the late game, this is one of the most powerful system improvements that I can imagine because it allows you to wage wars on the other side of the galaxy. Um, while still being supplied every turn by your core worlds. I don't quite understand why the Vaulters needed this. It's very cool, um, but it makes their late game uh, ability to, to pump out fleets and get new fleets to the front lines so, so, so fast and, and is so valuable. Um, yeah, I... I would say if you guys, again, have been fans of the channel, um, you'll know that in some of our PvP games that David and I have played against each other, we're so neck and neck in science that the difference between winning and losing a war can be the ability to upgrade your ships on the front line or get your new ships to the front line with the most modern upgrades. Um, because in the late game, that's the difference between having a fleet that has 5,000 total power versus 15,000 total power. Um, and the 15,000 one will just completely wipe the floor with the weaker fleet. But, but you need to get your upgraded ships there. And so the portals will be able to do that. I think they're super strong, but primarily in the late game. Okay, so that rounds up the... Um, my overview of the of the vaulters and some of their key um, their key traits. The last thing that I want to do is just go into very brief discussion of the strategy of the vaulters. So the idea here that Amplitude is going for, I think, is a really interesting one, which is that most of the factions in ES2 want to go wide, expand as quickly as possible um, in that that dynamic that we talked about of, of choosing outposts versus core systems. Um, I ha usually try to ride the line as much as possible to create as many outposts as I can for the first 30 turns to expand super, super, super fast. The vaulters can't do that effectively because they can't create colony ships. They're limited to just what the Argosi can do and have to invest a fair amount of their resources in order to expanding one colony at a time. But those single colonies end up growing very fast and being very good. Um, so this is like the, the 
prototypical um, trade-off in in the two strategies of 4x games: the going wide versus going tall. And the vaulters are the um, emblematic going tall uh, faction in Endless Space 2. I would say along with the two factions that are most similar to them, who are the Unfallen and the Vodiani, who are also very good at going tall. Um, specific strategies that I want to talk about with the Vaulters include, um, even though you're going tall, never wait to colonize when you don't have to. Use the marketplace to purchase um, your strategic resources and sell off your extra luxury resources to be able to use the Argosi as quickly as possible to expand and expand and expand. Never wait when you don't have to. And secondly, in the early game, you should use your crazy scout ships, the fairings, to um, explore a lot in the early game and then consolidate those ships switch them over into uh, military ships when you've got a good target and go after a military target because one of the ways that the vaulters can expand without the Argosi is to take over other civilizations. All right, this has definitely been going on long enough, so hopefully you guys enjoyed this introduction to the vaulters and uh, check out our long long-form expert guide that should be coming out shortly on the vaulters as well. Peace, guys.